Greetings, dear friends. I'm really happy to see you here today. And it's my pleasure uh, to uh, talk with you about effective English lessons in a changeable learning environment. So, uh, first of all, uh, in order for me to understand if you can hear me well, uh, I would like to ask you to put a plus or yes or no uh, in the chat um, answering the following question. Do you always uh, fulfill your aim uh, of your lesson uh, at the end of the lesson of English? So do you always feel that you have succeeded? So please put a plus. Uh, if you think that yes, uh, all your lessons are successful, and uh, put a minus. If you think that yes, and put, uh, all your lessons put a minus if uh, you are not quite sure. So thank you very much. Now, uh, first of all, a few words about me. Uh, my name is Hanna Dudic, and uh, I am a teacher of English. Uh, and a vice principal at uh, the Rashchenko Gymnasium in Kropivnitsky. Uh, I am also a top 50 finalist of the Global Teacher Prize uh, uh, in 2017 uh, and the speaker of several uh, international and uh, national Ukrainian uh, educational events like uh, the Global Education and Skills Forum uh, and several other uh, teaching uh, teachers forums and uh, also an ambassador of several educational projects uh, among which are uh, the uh, Varki teacher ambassador, Penpa schools ambassador, the scientists ambassador and the hundred ambassador. Uh, so uh, being an ambassador of uh, these different educational uh, projects uh, I got a possibility to um, take the best experience of uh, colleagues from all over the world and apply it at uh, my own lessons and about some of these ideas that I have borrowed from my uh, foreign colleagues we are going to talk uh, now uh, during our webinar uh, and uh, I'm also an innovative educator expert Microsoft innovative educator expert and uh, a certified uh, Neoport teacher and a National Geographic certified teacher, which also helped me to uh, use some tools at the lesson of uh, at my lessons of English. Uh, so uh, the plan of our uh, uh, webinar today is uh, the following. First of all, we are going to talk with you about uh, what is actually an effective uh, lesson of English. Uh, we are going to discuss face-to-face uh, -face and online uh, lessons, how uh, they differ and uh, in what ways are they similar. And uh, I will share my experience of enriching textbook material, uh, how to make textbooks uh, more motivating. Uh, and also I will share my experience of uh, using limited resources effectively uh, with the help of uh, the method called stations rotation. Uh, we will speak about uh, how to conduct different interactive activities uh, during COVID restrictions and uh, is it actually an utopia or is it a reality uh, to practice different interactive uh, activities with your students both in class and during your offline lessons uh, and uh, uh, how to uh, use, uh, how to develop effectively speaking, listening, writing and reading skills of your students. Uh, so uh, now uh, let us continue and uh, first of all my first uh, question is uh, what is an effective lesson? So you may uh, ask me actually what is an effective lesson? Uh, is it the lesson from which uh, your kids uh, uh, go out knowing some new grammar or uh, new vocabulary or uh, just knowing some uh, something new about the English speaking countries. Um, for me, this is not uh, the main uh, characteristic of uh, an effective English lesson. I think that an effective English lesson, uh, as probably any kind of lesson, not only the lesson of English, is the lesson from which every student, irrespective of his or her um, academic success lives with a smile on his or her face. Uh, 
when students are happy after your lesson. So this is an effective lesson for me. So uh, I hope that you do share my opinion. This, uh, then it is an effective lesson for you as well. Uh, because our um, emotional well-being is really uh, closely connected to our um, intellectual abilities, to our desire to learn, to our motivation to learn. Um, how to make our students happy? So my first rule is uh, for students not to be afraid to use the language. This is about correcting mistakes. Uh, of course, it is really uh, important to correct the mistakes and uh, uh, to correct them properly, to show the students uh, how to speak or write correctly, but at the same time not to overcorrect. Because if we use uh, correction uh, as punishment, then our students probably will not uh, be eager to speak or to write uh, anymore. Uh, I have a rule not to put too many marks during uh, the regular lessons. If we do some practice exercises, I would rather um, wait uh, till uh, some further lessons when we uh, do some formative assessment, when we do some summative assessment. Uh, I may turn assessment into a game. Uh, then the students will see that they have probably made a mistake, but they will not be afraid of making the mistakes. Uh, the next point when stu which makes students happy is uh, using language for real-life situations. Very often we can see in some textbooks um, examples uh, which explain the grammar rules, but these sentences, these examples, may hardly ever be used in real life. I believe that such uh, examples, sh such sentences should not be used in uh, our textbooks because Every word our students see, every sentence that our students come across should really be useful for them. Uh, and uh, the language, uh, the means of language is communication. Uh, that is why we are learning a foreign language. Uh, what is the use of learning some uh, sentences or phrases which may never be used in real life? So I think there is no sense to waste time uh, on such things. Uh, my next rule is beauty lies in diversity. Uh, even if you think that this topic is interesting or this activity is really cool, it does not mean that this topic or this activity will be uh, cool and interesting for every single student in your classroom. So somebody may like it and somebody may not. For somebody, sport is uh, his or her life. For some other student, art is more important. Uh, somebody will be crazy about English. Uh, so uh, be happy about it and try to use their interests as uh, your strengths and their strengths. For example, if your kids are uh, really uh, fond of Minecraft, why not uh, craft, for example, uh, the places of interest of English-speaking countries using the Minecraft uh, Education Edition? And uh, you will allow them to do what they like and you will also... Uh, use their hobbies uh, at the lesson of English. Every lesson, of course, should have clear aims and objectives. And uh, if your students do not understand why they are doing this or that exercise and what will they get uh, after finishing the exercise, uh, what will they learn after finishing the exercise, then probably they will not uh, understand, they will not be motivated. To do it and uh, to do it correctly and to do it in the uh, in the right way to do it to their best. Uh, my next rule, my final rule, is less is better. Uh, some teachers boast that uh, they can assign like ten sentences for uh, home uh, homework, or they uh, managed to do uh, fifteen exercises uh, during the uh, lesson. So. It is not mm, a sports race. Uh, lesson is meant to be mm, to be taught, is meant to teach, uh, to fulfill our aims and objectives. That is why I think that it is better to do uh, less uh, exercises, but uh, to make sure that all the students understand the material. Uh, and uh, if you have early finishers, if you have those in your class, in your group who uh, are usually quicker than uh, the rest of the class, 
so it is, it is good for you to have a bank of extra activities, uh, which they can do while all the other students are uh, trying to finish uh, your assignments. So these are just the basic rules. But all uh, these rules uh, make up one top rule. Happy students. Happy students mean uh, effective English lesson. We were all forced uh, to uh, move online during our uh, restriction times. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not, it is not a secret that sometimes we uh, switch now from face-to-face -to, -face to online and then back to face-to-face. -to -face and uh, uh, we have to adjust. One of the problems uh, that most teachers had was that they simply transferred their usual face-to-face -face lesson to the online uh, environment and did not make any changes. And it resulted in uh, a great number of problems. Uh, in some ways, face-to-face -face lessons and online lessons are similar. They do have a lot of similarities. Uh, but there are some uh, peculiarities, some differences that we do have uh, to keep in mind when we prepare for our lessons. Uh, I think that one uh, idea that should be really taken into account is communication. Kids need communication. We know that uh, our online lessons can be both synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, you may conduct your synchronous lessons uh, using different video tools like uh, Zoom or Google Meet or whatever you prefer. Uh, or you can uh, connect with your students uh, using your platforms, learn, learning management uh, platforms uh, that your school is using. How, uh, however, we have um, the rules, we have some uh, clarifications from the Ministry of Education that if we are teaching offline, uh, then uh, if we are teaching online, I'm sorry, then not every lesson should be synchronous. There can be also asynchronous lessons. Uh, you can post tasks in Google Class or in Microsoft Teams in whatever uh, management system you are using. But here we should keep in mind that communication is really essential. Uh, even if you assign uh, the exercises uh, in Google Class, you should uh, make sure that your students uh, have the channel of communication with you, that they can ask questions if something is not clear, uh, that they can uh, comment on their work and uh, receive comments from you. So this is really important and this is what I have noticed. Uh, another important uh, problem is collaboration. When we are in a physical uh, learning environment, in a real classroom, collaboration is not a problem. Especially uh, during the lessons of English. Uh, we uh, very often organize group work, pair work, uh, where our teach uh, our children work uh, with different tasks uh, uh, together and uh, it is the responsibility of the whole group um, to, uh, to complete this task. When we work in uh, a digital world, in a digital classroom, is it possible to uh, create some collaborat uh, collaborative tasks to ensure that your students work together being physically apart? Yes, uh, fortunately, with the help of modern technology, it is possible. And today I will show you a couple of uh, ideas, a couple of tips that I used. Uh, it is also important to keep eye contact. For me, as a teacher, uh, it is really important to uh, see from the eyes of my students if they understand what I'm talking about or not. So, uh, especially when I present new grammar. What I have noticed is that when I am teaching online, when I have uh, my synchronous uh, lessons in Zoom, my younger students, the fifth, sixth, and seventh formers, would usually keep their cameras on, and uh, they are okay with it. But when I teach in uh, the ninth and eleventh forms, uh, my uh, older students would prefer to uh, have their cameras off. Can you please react somehow in the uh, chat if you have the same problem? So do your uh, older teens prefer to keep their cameras off when you teach uh, your online lessons in Zoom or in Google Meet? Um, I think that it is common for lots of people. I uh, have developed an agreement with my students. I really insist on, my, uh, on keeping cameras on uh, for my younger students. 
the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh forms should have all their cameras on. Because I uh, cannot be sure of what they are doing. They are, uh, are they following me or are they playing computer games or whatever? So that is why we have a strict rule. So please keep your cameras on and your microphones off. Uh, if I'm teaching in uh, all the classes, I uh, have come to an agreement with my students that when I am uh, explaining the grammar, I would like them to keep the cameras on. And uh, I want to see if they understand me or not. And when we are doing some practice exercises, then I allow them to keep their cameras off. Because uh, at this point, they may be working uh, in their exercise books or online uh, on our digital worksheets. And it is not that important for me to see their eyes. And it works fine because uh, I have uh, what is important for me, the eye contact. And they have what is important for them, their privacy. And this agreement uh, allows us to keep this balance. And it leads to one more rule. Uh, stick to the rules, but be flexible. On the one hand, uh, if we have the rules, we need to stick to them. And uh, we have uh, just clear routine, uh, both in our physical classroom and in our online classroom. Cameras on, everybody should have cameras on. Uh, microphones muted, everybody should have microphones muted. If you come to the class, come prepared. Everybody should come prepared. If you are not ready for the lesson, so please have a note from your parents explaining uh, why you are not ready. I do understand that there might be some problems, yes? But please give me the note before the lesson, not uh, at the moment when I am asking you to read the home task. So these are the clear rules. But here, the next uh, part of this uh, rule, be flexible. And I think flexibility is uh, like golden rule uh, in our pandemic times because there might be some uh, situations which we cannot even imagine. So uh, God knows what is going on there at home of our students and uh, maybe they do not want to talk about it even. Even if we have this hybrid mode when uh, some lessons are online and some lessons are offline and we switch from one to another and uh, sometimes they come unprepared, there might be some real uh, reasons for them to be unprepared. Uh, so try to understand that be fle flexible, though I know it is quite difficult. My other rule is physical activity. When we are in a real classroom, face-to-face -face classroom, uh, it is easy for us to stand up to, even if we organize different activities like peer work or group work, children stand up, move around the classroom, and uh, they do uh, some physical activity. But when they are sitting uh, in front of their computers uh, at home, it is quite difficult for them to stand up. So try to think about some uh, activities which you prepare uh, at least uh, every second lesson, uh, which will... Uh, allow your students to uh, move at least sitting uh, in front of the computers, like uh, uh, turn around, turn to the left, turn to your, uh, to your right, or just uh, look here, look there. Uh, at least uh, they will uh, try not to uh, make their eyes tired, or they will try to look away from the screen. So this will be a positive uh, idea for your students. And of course, clear aims and instructions. Uh, what I have found is uh, found out is uh, if my students do not do the task, uh, this or that task, uh, as I wanted them to do it, it was probably in 80% of uh, the cases my fault because I did not give clear instructions. If students uh, understand what I want them to do, so they usually do it uh, in a proper way. When I uh, start any unit from our textbook, uh, no matter what textbook I am using, I have uh, come to the conclusion that it is great to enrich textbook with something else. Uh, what can we enrich our textbook with? Uh, it can be modern technology, which can provide us with uh, just really valuable uh, resources. I teach using uh, the books called Wider World, and the books themselves, textbooks, are really great. They are uh, really, really interesting, but I still uh, try to enrich the material from the textbook with uh, uh, 3D animations, with virtual reality field trips, and uh, with uh, other activities using technology, which I'm sure will be interesting for our teenagers. Because you know that modern teenagers, they are digital generation, 
and they really love using uh, different technology uh, at the lessons and at home. So my, uh, I will uh, share with you some of my favorite tools. Uh, two of my favorite tools are MozaWeb. Uh, it is an online platform where you can find uh, different types of material to enrich any topic and any lesson. Uh, I usually use 3D animations from uh, MozaWeb. MozaWeb is a multilingual tool and uh, it usually uh, has, uh, it has everywhere in all these animations, English version. So you can use this English version to enrich your uh, topics. And uh, if you do not know how to use uh, MozaWeb at the lessons, uh, our Ukrainian uh, company at Pro usually uh, once in a month uh, gives a series of webinars, professional development webinars, where they teach how uh, teach uh, free of charge uh, how to use uh, the Moza Web content uh, at the lessons. So uh, another tool that I really love is Google Expeditions, and uh, this is the application which you can install on your uh, mobile devices, on your smartphones or tablets, and there you can. Uh, look at uh, 360 animations, uh, panoramic, panoramic pictures, uh, and uh, all these uh, panoramic pictures would be supplied uh, by, uh, uh, with a, tef, a text. And uh, the text will be in English, and uh, uh, at the end of the text you will have a, a series of qu questions with uh, several levels of difficulty, uh, which allows us to uh, practice reading. So what do I usually do? So here is my example. Uh, you can see uh, the text from our textbook. The text is called When Will the Lights Go Out? So this was the text uh, about uh, windmills uh, in Europe. Uh, the topic uh, of the unit was ecology and renewable, uh, renewable energy. Uh, so in MozaWeb I found 3D animations of uh, the windmills. Uh, we are the children uh, using the interactive whiteboard could look at uh, the uh, windmill could uh, see uh, all the parts of the windmill how they are called uh, could see the process how the energy is uh, acquired from the windmill how it is uh, transferred into the type of energy that we uh, use into electricity uh, and uh, also I found uh, a virtual field trip to one of the biggest windmills in Europe. And uh, there we are six uh, panoramic pictures of uh, different uh, locations on this uh, biggest in Europe uh, windmill uh, factory. And uh, students could uh, have a look. And it was really cool because if you are looking at uh, a panoramic picture, uh, using your tablet or smartphone, you can move around. Uh, you can either use your finger to move uh, around and you can see this panoramic view, uh, not like 2D, but uh, three-dimensional all over the place. Uh, or you can just move your tablet or move your uh, smartphone and uh, you will see all these uh, beautiful pictures. And uh, uh, they could read the text which accompanied each picture and uh, uh, answer the questions which accompanied the text. So why? Uh, is it interesting to enrich textbook? First of all, because uh, you get authentic listening and reading practice, uh, because the texts which accompany 3D animations in Moza and uh, virtual reality field trips, they are authentic, but they are meant for education. They are educational, ju not just any text from uh, the online uh, space. It is visualization. Our students, our teenagers, uh, they are the, the digital generation and they uh, really remember things better when they can see them. And of course it's motivation because if you uh, just read the text about uh, windmills in the, in the textbook, okay, some uh, students may be interested in it, some maybe not. But if they have a chance to uh, look at all the details of this 3D animation and move it around uh, on their uh, interactive whiteboard, and use this uh, virtual field trip on the tablet. So it is great, it motivates them to study. Uh, and you can choose a 3D animation and a VR practically for any topic you like. And of course, uh, as a teacher of English, I can't uh, stop uh, thinking that it really 
uh, enriches their vocabulary because uh, the text that uh, they will hear while working with the 3D and the text that they will read uh, while working with the virtual reality field trip will uh, contain some vocabulary uh, which will be connected to the topic of uh, the lesson but it will not be from the textbook it will be extra vocabulary and this is really great because it is really useful for them so here is another example uh, the topic of the whole unit was music musical instruments and usually uh, we will have like eight or ten or even more lessons per one unit I think uh, it is true for everybody. So how do I enrich not a separate lesson uh, or a separate text, but the whole unit? Uh, I usually use such a, a platform which is called PenPal Schools. It is the international collaborative learning platform. Uh, on this platform, you can find uh, different projects. So they call uh, the developers of the uh, platform call them projects. And all these projects are devoted to a separate topic. For example, the topics are usually uh, similar to what we have in our textbooks. Uh, for example, music or food around the world or uh, languages, uh, the world languages or the weather, for example. So your task is to choose the topic which, uh, which is similar to the topic that you are learning uh, in your textbook, which is similar to the topic of your unit, textbook unit. And then on the Penpal Schools platform, you will have um, a video recording uh, specially designed for students. Then a text which your students can read after watching a video. And then there will be several questions uh, which uh, uh, your students will have to answer in writing in a special safe chat environment uh, on the platform. And as soon as they enter their answer to the question, uh, their answer will appear in uh, the general chat box and uh, the students from different countries who are working uh, on the same project, on the same topic, will be able to read what they have written and to comment. And then they have a, a real chat with students from different countries, which is really great because your students will be able to use the language, uh, the vocabulary that you are learning now in your textbook in a real uh, learning environment, uh, real in real situations, uh, communicating with real students from different countries. So you can see that here our unit was called the music of life and we were speaking about music and musical instruments. And uh, uh, the uh, project which we found on the Pentel Schools platform was called a world of music. So uh, those two topics uh, resonated. And uh, uh, Usually, I work, as I said, with Penpal Schools platform uh, during the whole unit uh, covered in our textbook, so for from 8 to uh, 15 lessons. Uh, at the beginning, I usually introduce my students to the Penpal Schools platform and say that we will do it like uh, in parallel ways. So uh, we will learn new vocabulary connected with the topic, we will learn new grammar, and then you will have time as long as you want for two weeks, maybe for three weeks, to complete your Penpal Schools project. And the main idea is to communicate with your friends from different countries. There is no time limit, there, there are no deadlines, so it is free communication. Uh, but it is safe because it is protected by the platform and uh, uh, there is no uh, bullying there and it is a completely safe uh, learning educational environment international environment which will help you also to show your students that the language they are learning is for communication so why do we use uh, why do i use penpal schools platform to enrich my textbook uh, experience because i can develop uh, my students writing skills because they will have to answer the questions in writing listening skills because they will listen uh, short educational uh, videos uh, on the platform and reading skills because they will read the text which is connected to the topic in our students book uh, because it is real life communication with real children real students from different countries the program usually matches your students with uh, the students from different countries of the same age so they will communicate if they are for example 10 years old they will communicate with somebody who is 9 10 or 11 uh, 
which will make their communication real and interesting. And it is learning with the world and about the world because uh, the topics there on the platform are really great and the videos and uh, the texts are really interesting to read. Uh, another favorite program that I'm using, another favorite application that I really enjoy using is called Google Arts and Culture Selfie App. It is really uh, fantastic. So when uh, you have uh, the topic of your lesson or of your unit, which is called Art and Artist, uh, we usually uh, learn about uh, the artists of the English-speaking countries. We speak about Ukrainian famous artists, some students who uh, are fond of art, uh, who like drawing and painting, would really enjoy it. Some others who don't care about art uh, may find it boring, but how do you make it fun and exciting? If you uh, ask your students to uh, upload Google Art and Culture app from uh, the uh, Google Play Market or from uh, the iOS uh, App Store, you will be able to uh, play such a wonderful game with your students. It is called Google Art Selfie application. It allows you to take a selfie. So this is something which uh, our students really enjoy doing. So taking selfies and this program then matches your selfie with really famous portraits painted by uh, different artists that are uh, kept somewhere in the world in some art galleries. And I should tell you that this program uh, is doing really great job because it matches, uh, matches like 90% uh, or 60% uh, it finds 90 or 60 percent match. Uh, the, the portraits uh, which this program finds really look like your selfie. Here you can see that I put some uh, emojis on students' faces because I do not want to reveal their faces. But I hope that you do believe me that these uh, selfies really look like uh, the paintings, the famous portraits. What do you do then? Of course, first it's fun. You uh, and your stu students have a laugh. You relax and uh, you understand that learning is really fun. Not only just uh, learning the rules and writing grammar exercises, but it is not just fun. It is also educational. So what do you do then? Uh, you develop speaking and learn about an artist and his art. Uh, on top of this match, you will see the information about this uh, piece of art. So, how is it called? And the name of the of the author, of the artist. So, the next next task might be for your student to find some information about the artist and uh, about this portrait and prepare it for the next lesson. So, uh, I think it's a great uh, task for students while learning about art and artists. Uh, you can also describe the portrait, ask your students to describe the portrait. You can ask them to find similarities and differences between their selfie and the portrait that uh, the application uh, has found. I think that they will enjoy doing this. Uh, I showed you uh, on the previous slides that uh, I am using uh, such uh, technology as uh, tablets, smartphones, uh, interactive whiteboard, but you may say, you may have a question, so what should I do if we have, for example, uh, only a couple of tablets uh, or only white interactive whiteboard, but we have got uh, the whole class of students, like 24 students, uh, what do I do then? My favorite uh, method when we have limited resources, uh, when I want to use them effectively, uh, this method is called stations rotation. Uh, it is a kind of uh, blended learning method, uh, meaning that uh, if you have a big group of students and uh, limited uh, technology, you may divide your students into several groups and uh, organize your group, way, uh, your group work in such a way that some groups will be using technology and some groups will be using textbook material or worksheets, printed worksheets. Uh, but groups will rotate in such a way uh, that all groups during one lesson 
will be able to visit each station and will be able to work both with technology and with uh, paper sources of information like books, uh, textbooks or uh, uh, worksheets. Uh, for example, I usually have three stations. So if I have a class of 24 students and if this class is not uh, divided into groups, subgroups uh, for learning English, uh, we may divide 24 into three and we will have three mini groups. One mini group will start their lesson at the station uh, with their te textbooks or worksheets and they will have the assignment there to study, to look at the text, to work with the text, for example, to find some uh, information there. Uh, group number two will have to work with uh, uh, one piece of technology. It can be virtual reality headset. For example, I have just one virtual reality uh, headset. But uh, I want all students in the class to use it and uh, to have a look at uh, some animations, some virtual reality uh, experience there. How do I do it if I have lots of students? If I break up my class into three mini groups, I will be able to do it. Uh, group number three will work with tablets, for example, or with the interactive whiteboard and uh, Moza web experience. Uh, on each station, my students will have to spend only 10 minutes. Then I will give, give a signal and uh, groups will uh, move clockwise. And those who were working with textbooks will move to the station with uh, VR headsets or with uh, the interactive workbook, uh, uh, whiteboard, for example. Those who were using the VR headset would move to station number two where uh, students are using tablets. Those who are using tablets will move to the station where they are using textbook. Uh, all the students, all the groups will have similar worksheets with the tasks that they will have to complete at each station. Uh, at the end of the lesson, so if we spend 10 minutes at each st station, it would be 30 minutes of the lesson. Five minutes I will uh, set the task at the beginning of the lesson, and then I will have uh, 10 minutes at the end of the lesson to for the whole uh, class, for all three groups to come together, and we will have joint discussion, uh, discussing uh, the outcomes, the answers on their worksheets. Uh, and they will tell me which of the activities they liked most of all, which of the... Uh, uh, stations uh, was the most exciting for them. Uh, usually, when I have such, uh, when I organize such a lesson, I would have uh, my assistants. I would appoint uh, one student per each station who would assist me with technology and with tasks. Because if you are uh, the only teacher in the classroom and you have three stations and you will have to run uh, just uh, around all these stations helping your students. Uh, it will be a little bit chaotic, but if you have uh, one person uh, who will help you at each station, that will be much better. Of course, these appointed students will have to do some extra work because they will have uh, they will know about the tasks beforehand. Uh, they will know how to assist with technology technical issues while preparing technology. Uh, but that's really fun. You can change them. So one lesson, uh, one set of students would be your assistants, and the other uh, lesson. You may appoint somebody else, and they really love this kind of work. Uh, is it possible to organize such activities at uh, times of COVID restrictions? I have found that it is really possible. Uh, though um, we know that uh, our students uh, are not supposed to move, for example, from classroom to classroom now when we uh, have these uh, quarantine restrictions, uh, we still can organize some interactive uh, activities, of course, if we clean shared devices. That is why I have a rule now. So if we use uh, the tablets which are not their own tablets, which are the school tablets, and uh, if we have the station's rotations, uh, there is a rule. So after using the tablet, please clean it with the sanitizer. Uh, please clean your hands with the sanitizer and then you may m move on to the next station. Uh, at first I was afraid a little bit to organize group work and peer work uh, in the post-COVID uh, classroom when we uh, got back to face-to-face -to -face teaching. But then I understood that our students uh, are still in a group. So they are in what is called uh, a mini bubble. 
Yes, and they uh, come in the morning and uh, communicate with all people in their mini bubble, uh, with all these uh, 24, 25, 30 people uh, till afternoon. They still communicate. So there is no uh, need to forget about interactive activities. But do keep in mind safety and do insist uh, that your students should uh, sanitize their hands after moving uh, around the classroom, after touching some objects, and sanitize shared devices. Uh, I also try not to forget and remind my students at every uh, online class uh, to keep in mind this uh, regular routine, new routine that we need to learn, how to wash your hands. Uh, I got two really exciting ideas. Uh, I found them online. Uh, I found them in Facebook. One idea uh, was a big poster with lots of lots of different hands, and you can see it here on the slide. Uh, and uh, there were the rules of washing hands all over the poster. So the task for my students was uh, I shared uh, this poster uh, with the help of uh, this uh, share option in Zoom and uh, gave my students the uh, ability to write and I asked them to find all the sentences describing how you can wash your hands, uh, how you should wash your hands uh, and underline them or circle them and uh, then comment uh, if they follow these rules or not and they learned these rules and it was really fun. And another activity which uh, I enjoyed and my students enjoyed a lot uh, I went on Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, official Facebook page and there I saw um, just a really adorable video. Arnold Schwarzenegger recorded a video teaching his pet, his tiny Yorkshire Terrier dog, how to wash hands properly. It was hilarious, I'm telling you. Um, I showed this video, it was only like one minute long or a minute and a half. I showed this video to my students. They were so excited because they all know Arnold Schwarzenegger. They all have seen movies with him. Uh, and uh, they were surprised, first of all, to see that he was uh, not this just big guy that they are uh, used to seeing on, on screen, but that he was uh, such a great person talking to his uh, tiny dog and uh, uh, really uh, trying to teach children how to wash their hands. And then uh, after this video, I'm sure that the students uh, learned how to do it properly and used it in their everyday life. And we often uh, recollect this activity and uh, uh, try to laugh at it. Uh, go on Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, Facebook page and I'm sure you will find some more interesting uh, ideas there. So he is really a great person to watch. Uh, now, uh, how do you uh, develop uh, reading, writing? speaking and uh, listening skills online and offline. So just uh, some tips that I find useful. When it comes to speaking, if it is your face-to-face -face classroom, it is really uh, okay, it is no problem, you engage students in dialogues, uh, in monologues, whatever. But if you are offline, so I found some really great resources. So first of all, uh, if you need to check uh, monological speech, uh, I use Random wheel, a random wheel tool or exercise uh, from uh, the site which is called Word Wall Net. Uh, I'm sure that some of you have probably heard about it. So if you go to that website and choose this interactive activity, you may put the topic, uh, the spoken topic, or a question which you would like your students to answer on one of the parts of this wheel, and then you uh, start. And uh, uh, you click start and the wheel rotates and then the arrow puts randomly, uh, points randomly at any question on the wheel. And uh, in such a way your students uh, should answer this or that question. Your students can press uh, the button start uh, themselves if you give them control uh, over uh, the screen. Uh, you can use this activity also when you are teaching offline in real classroom. If you uh, use it on your laptop, so it may help you just to choose the correct topic uh, for your students to answer. 
You may ask how uh, to organize uh, group work or peer work when you are uh, in a uh, video chat with your students when uh, while using Zoom, for example. I usually use Zoom and I found it useful to uh, use such an option as breakout rooms. So this option allows you to divide your group of students or your whole class into several subgroups. Uh, you can either divide them randomly, uh, just to point how many groups you would like to have. Uh, and the program will divide your students into groups and they will be uh, in separate Zoom sessions, mini Zoom sessions. You set the task, for example, compose a dialogue, yes? And they will compose a dialogue and you as a teacher will be able to move from one breakout room to another breakout room, listening, helping, assessing your students, giving them feedback. And then uh, you can ask everybody to come back to uh, the general session and you may discuss what you have learned. Uh, so it gives us uh, ability to save time during online lessons and to practice uh, speaking in uh, mini groups, uh, dialogical speech, not only monologues. Uh, we all know such an activity as uh, hold your position. When you have uh, two questions like yes or no, uh, choose your position, do you support this idea or not? Uh, when I'm teaching in uh, a real world, in the real classroom, I usually ask my students, I put it on the blackboard or on the whiteboard, yes, no, and ask them to stand next to the option that they choose. They move around, they stand next to the uh, option that they choose, and they then they say, uh, in one sentence, why uh, do they support or not support this idea? Uh, in the virtual classroom, I usually use a, a Canva group template. If you go to Canva, uh, this is a uh, program online which al allows you to visualize uh, pretty well different ideas. So it has got the whole set of group templates, group work templates. Uh, this is the example of the template uh, that uh, is like yes, no template. You ask your students to log in and then they just move their avatar to the right position, yes or no, and write just one sentence explaining why they like this or that uh, idea, why they support or not support this or that idea. Uh, now, uh, how do you develop writing skills online and offline? Uh, when we speak about uh, giving written assignments, we usually we are used usually to the fact that uh, those assignments are usually checked only by the teacher. Other students do not read what uh, everybody in class has written. I sometimes practice the following idea. I ask my students to write not in the exercise books but on the sheets of paper and uh, sign at the back of the, uh, of the sheet of paper, their surname, and uh, leave uh, on the front page only the text. Then I stick these uh, pieces of writing to the walls, and uh, I ask all the, the whole group to walk around to read all the essays, for example, to read all the letters, whatever is written there, uh, and comment, or put stickers, or put pluses next to uh, the papers, or on the papers which they really uh, find interesting or exciting or uh, motivating uh, which uh, on those works which stand out. And then I promise that I usually give uh, one extra point to uh, the essay that will get more reactions from the rest of the class. It motivates students because they write uh, in an interesting way. Uh, it is real writing which somebody else uh, aside from the teacher uh, will read. When we uh, practice writing offline, uh, I usually use collaborative uh, writing space like uh, Padlet, for example, or Google Jamboard, which allows you to post your writing on the, the shared uh, place, on the shared board, and you can also read what other students have written and comment on other students' works. Usually I ask my students not only to write the answer to the question or to write uh, their comment, but also to comment on their uh, fellow students, on their classmates' work, and uh, uh, to explain uh, if they support their idea or not, and to show me which of the answers were uh, more interesting to read. How to develop reading skills? And that is what I would like to attract your attention to. Uh, when we uh, try to develop reading skills, uh, we often say that our uh, modern students do not like reading. 
Uh, well, this is not exactly true. Uh, they do like reading, but they read in a different way. Uh, they read graphic novels. They read comics books. Uh, they read uh, not paper books, but uh, not printed editions, but uh, digital editions. They do read. Uh, maybe they do, they do not like to read what we ask them to read, but that's another question. Uh, very soon, next week, there will be a really great event called World Read Aloud Day. It will be celebrated on the 3rd of February. And you will be able to join this event. If you follow the link uh, on the slide, uh, you will find lots and lots of resources there. So this day is celebrated annually. And here are the pictures uh, from the activities which we uh, organized uh, on this day, but uh, several years ago, a couple of years ago, before uh, our COVID restrictions. Uh, so what do you usually do if you want to celebrate the World Read Aloud Day? So first of all, you go, uh, you click the link, go online and register your class or your school. Uh, then you uh, join the international movement. You partner up with a teacher of foreign literature, for example, because it will be great to connect with uh, the other teachers from your school and do it together. Uh, you may ask uh, which books by uh, English and American writers your students uh, are learning and uh, choose this book. Let them read the book uh, in Ukrainian, in translation, at the lessons of foreign language and prepare an extract from this book to read at the lesson of English. So they can compare the English version and the, the translated version of the book. Then you may also find such activities as a Skype call with modern authors uh, on that website, uh, Lit World, which organizes the World Read Aloud Day. And imagine having a Skype call with your class, uh, of your class with a real author from uh, the USA, for example, or from Canada or from Great Britain. That would be really amazing. You can have a Skype call with another class who also decided to participate in the World Read Aloud Day and discuss the book that you were reading. And that would be also great. Uh, you can make bookmarks or readers' crowns to celebrate uh, your kids as great readers. And you can see our kids uh, sitting here in the reading crowns that they made. Uh, you can role-play book scenes. Our kids here are uh, in uh, the middle of the role-play uh, of uh, Mark Twain's uh, Tom Sawyer's Adventures. So uh, you can uh, come up with lots and lots of different ideas. And uh, there on the website you will find... Uh, the whole bunch of uh, posters and stickers and uh, other visual aids that you may use to promote reading and to help your students understand that reading is really great. Uh, how do you develop listening skills? And this will be the last thing that I'm going to tell you today. When we develop listening skills online and offline, uh, so uh, try to make listening authentic. This was uh, the activity which we did uh, just a few days ago. Uh, on the website NASA, I found such a possibility, um, such, an, mm, such a lesson for the students. The astronaut who is now on the International Space Station uh, was reading a book, children's book, fairy tale, for children on the Earth. And it was, uh, trans uh, it was um, showed live on the official YouTube channel of NASA and children could listen to the astronaut and children could then ask questions uh, in the chat uh, like you are doing now, you can ask me questions and the astronaut could comment on children's questions and it was really cool because here you develop listening skills after it you can discuss it uh, next lesson with your students and I was really amazed uh, that my fifth formers understood what the astronaut was reading them about and they wrote some pretty good questions in the chat box uh, about not only about the book but about uh, the astronaut's life uh, in space and uh, about science in general. So these are authentic uh, activities which can develop listening. And if you want to see uh, what else is there on the NASA website, follow the link and uh, you will be able to sign up to future events because these events are regular. They do them, uh, they do this space reading uh, 
quite often on a regular basis. So now, thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Uh, I haven't noticed any questions in the chat while listening to you, but maybe you have got some questions uh, which I can answer right now. So I'm ready to answer. So can you please comment interesting and useful information? So thank you very much. Maybe there would be some questions that uh, I have missed. So I'm looking uh, carefully at the chat box. But unfortunately, I can't see any. <laughs> okay. Um, so then, if we have uh, no questions, I hope that the information was useful for you. And it is time to say goodbye now. Uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. And uh, hope that you will find something useful for uh, your future work. So, goodbye. And see you next time on the platform uh, Now Rock during our further webinars. Thank you, everybody.